morning, Wareham. It is Friday, January 25th. We have a great show here for you. The news headlines, the weather report, and today in history, Alan Slavin, the chairman of the Wareham Board of Selectmen, will share his views on retail marijuana in the town, and we'll take a look at both Verlife and the Organa brands, at what their influence will be in this town up next during the coffee segment. But first, I would like to take a moment to highlight Not Your Average Antiques, an antique shop down Cranberry Highway in East Wareham for donating props for the Good Morning Wareham set. So stay tuned because the weather and traffic are next. It is not as warm as it was yesterday and also not as cold as it not as rainy as it was yesterday either. Expect a few afternoon uh, clouds mainly sunny today with highs at 39 degrees, winds at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Clearly clear tonight with low at 18 degrees winds at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Saturday will be a mix of clouds and sunshine. Uh, at night, at high at 34 degrees, winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Cloudy Saturday night with low at 24 degrees. Sunday, partly cloudy with, um, with highs at 43 degrees, winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Cloudy Sunday night with low around 30 degrees. And expect normal traffic at Route 3 and 495. The weather conditions are very good, so safe travels, everyone. And now to the news. There were a few news stories over the weekend, and here are the news headlines. Wareham Week was bustling with these headlines over the weekend. Former Wareham School Committee member appointed to two-month seat. Members of the Wareham School Committee and the Board of Selectmen appointed Jeff Sweat at a town month to a two-month seat on the school committee Thursday night, filling a vacancy left by former committee member Rebecca Pratt in December. A veteran of the board, Sweat previously served on the committee for four terms starting in 2005. He lost his most recent election bid in April of 2018 to Pratt and Michael Frarity. The decision to fill Pratt's seat until the election came at the request of the remaining school committee members who said, it was hard to get work done in Pratt's absence. And in another news, tree knocks down power lines, strikes trailer on Toby Road in Wareham. Heavy wind and rain on Thursday knocked over a tree on Toby Road, damaging power lines and struck in an officer trailer. The Wareham Fire Department was alerted to the fallen tree at 12 Toby Road around 11.30 a.m. According to the emergency broadcast, the tree had fallen onto office trailer dam dragging near nearby power lines with it. Both the trailer and the neighboring commercial building lost the power as a result, but no injuries were reported. Eversource has since been alerted to the downed power lines. And to the other news, water pipes burst at Onset Antique Shop. Onset firefighters say broken water pipe caused the minimal damage to Onset Antique Shop on Wednesday afternoon. Crews were first alerted to the broken pipe at 234 Onset Avenue around 12.15 p.m. According to reports, water was running from the second story window down to the street below. The building is, is occupied although none of the tenants were home during the incident. 
First responders reportedly broke down a door to gain entry to the building to get to the pipe. The break was quickly corrected, however, sparing the building from significant damage. And Wareham Department of Natural Resources collects gift cards for Coast Guard families affected by the government shutdown. The Wareham Department of Natural Resources is collecting gift cards from now until February 1st to help members of the United States Coast Guard who are affected by the partial government shutdown. Now in its fifth week, actually now in day 35, the shutdown has affected more, some a sum of 800,000 government employees, according to published reports. It's been a 35 days since the shutdown started. And selectmen were changing Wareham's election date town meeting guidelines. Selectmen want to change the date of the annual town election from April to May, modifying some town meeting rules in a bid to clarify the process. Selectman Peter Teitelbaum said the town moderator, the chair of finance committee, and the town administrator, Derek Sullivan, met Tuesday morning to start drafting an agenda item for a vote at the upcoming town meeting this spring. Teitelbaum, speaking at Tuesday's selectman meeting, said that the town's attorney is now tasked with exploring options for changing the town's meeting deadline. Currently, the agenda must be posted 45 days before the meeting. And in another selectman news, selectmen dissolved Wareham's Bike Path Committee. committee. Selectmen dissolved the town's Bike Path Committee on Tuesday, citing the fact that only two people are currently on the board and have largely been inactive. Selectman Chair Alice Slaven said the committee had been working up until two years ago when it received approval to move forward with an engineering study. Slaven shared this statement. At the regional level, no one from Wareham is showing up expect, except for myself, and it is not really working out well. The committee had been working on the path for more than a decade and in 2011 town meeting, town meeting voters approved spending 200,000 of Community Preservation Act funds to cover the cost, the cost of the study. And also Weekend Local Wareham was buzzling with these headlines over the week. Wareham Culture Council distributes 9,000 for community programs in 2019. The Wareham Culture Council announces, announced the 20, program grant, the 20 program grants it is sponsoring using 9,000 in available funds for 2019 at the Board of Selectmen meeting on Tuesday night. And something to look forward to today is the all-day access to Opportunity Forum at Cape Verdean Veterans Memorial Hall in New Bedford. Everybody's welcome, including Wareham. The event started this morning at 8 and will continue until 4 p.m. Access to Opportunity Forum is a series of awareness, outreach, and recruitment forum focusing on access to education, apprenticeship, training, internships, employment, career path, and business development opportunities in the following economic markets. That is renewable clean energy sectors, green jobs, and community jobs. Once again, everybody is welcome, so check them out. That is all I have for the news headlines. Wareham Week is here this morning to cover the story of the day. So stay with us because we'll be right back after this short break.
And for story of the day, we have invited the source itself. Matt, the editor at Wareham Week, local newspaper, is here to join us to cover today's main story. Matt, welcome. Queen, thank you for having me. So this is your first time? It is, yes. <laughs> the show <laughs> looks great. The show looks great. Thank you so much. So what do you have for us? What are we discussing about We've today? We've been following a story mm. that's... Uh, kind of pits local history aficionados against South Coast Health who's okay. looking to expand their emergency department. Okay. And on the 31st, there's going to be a public hearing. Mm -hmm. On that day, the town's historic commission will be deciding on an application for a certificate of hardship okay. from South Coast Health. If they get that, South Coast will be a step closer to tearing down Toby Homestead. That's the big white building? Yes, the uh, gorgeous big white yes. building that I wish if I had the money to buy it. Exactly. It's 43 High Street, right on the corner of the Narrows, mm -hmm. right in front of the hospital. Okay. So, w have you spoken to the town? Anybody? Have you asked them? What are they saying? What I've been trying to get in touch with local history. It's really created a lot of emotion. Mm. It's, you know, a beautiful building. It's been there a lot of years. People worked back in the 80s to save it after yes. a fire almost destroyed it. And so back in March of 2017, mm -hmm. South Coast announced they were going to expand their emergency department. It's going to cost uh, millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And when it's done, it'll be right up against Main Street there. So just imagine that space completely filled with a new emergency department. Okay. So it seems that you mentioned in back in 1985 when there was a fire and mm -hmm. the town worked to save the building, in also 2017, members of the Historical Commission and Historical District Commission explored options for preserving the building. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there are a few people, population of people in this town, who want to see this building standing. They do, and uh, when they first announced plans, they looked closely okay. at can we move the building? Can we incorporate it into the new design? Mm -hmm. And South Coast found that that really wasn't feasible, and I don't think the people who want to move the building can raise the money in time yes. to move it. So it's just going to be completely torn down, based on what I've heard from South Coast. Now, do we know who owns the building, Matt? South Coast owns it. It's actually named after Alice Toby Jones. Mm -hmm. It was built in 1825, and she's actually who the hospital is named after. Okay. And, I'm sorry, what was the first No, it, it, so that was like, a, who owns the building? Oh, yes, so South Coast does, yes. So, why, do we have any footing in this argument? The town of Wareham, really, does it have any leverage? Well, right now, this hearing, um, if South Coast gets the certificate of hardship, they will be able to move forward and demolish it. Now, the Historic Commission could say no mm -hmm. and deny the application, but in Massachusetts, there's um, certain protections for historic buildings. Okay. But there are exemptions for medical facilities in this case. So if they were to deny it, I don't think they would be able to come back and appeal that. So then why the hearing? If it seems that we, the town cannot do anything, they cannot say yes or no, it's mm -hmm. up to Toby Hospital, why are we having the hearing? It's part of the process. In the town bylaws, you have to come to these historic commissions which um, it's actually, there's a few in town, and anytime people want to make a uh, renovation or a change to a historic building that's mm. over 75 years old in one of those districts, yes. it has to go to these commissions. That's just the way it's set up. So it's all going to be open to public too? People can yes, come. people can come down. They can say they love the homestead. They can say they want to see it gone. They mm. want a new apart uh, emergency department. So it's really a place people can come and air their views and be heard. Now, reading at comments under Wareham Week uh, regarding this story, all of the comments, everybody, the, my favorite one is the Wareham by the Sea gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, very prolific. He, yes, he says, tear it down. Mm -hmm. It's about time. You mm -hmm. know, he says, why should we have this hearing? People are going to come and they're going to say, we love it. But what has the building done for us? It's been empty for a long time. Mm. But like I said, back in the 80s, it almost burned down. Yeah. And so the town really rallied. People love this building. It's kind of an icon. You know, when you think Wareham, you think that building. It's <laughs> on the corner. It's right on Main Street. Yes. And, um, but like I said, you know, the, the, the emergency department was designed to handle 15,000 patients a year back in 87. Now they handle 30,000 people. Yeah, and so this new true. department would be able to accommodate 40,000 people. Okay. So it's really... You asked about what the building has done for us? Yes. It's 
not much. It's, it's really aesthetic. It, it looks good, and it, there's really no like, purpose, I suppose. Okay. And I, I, I reading about it, they said that um, it's not up to code, and it's going to take a lot of money to mm -hmm. get that building up to mm -hmm. code. So it's almost not worth it. And um, I've always loved the building. As I said, mm -hmm. I wish I had mm -hmm. the million and millions of dollars to mm -hmm. buy it mm -hmm. um, and make it my house. I'm going to be sad mm -hmm. if the building goes. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, I'd be sad too. I live right near there. I, I can see it from my Aww. from my door, and it's just it's beautiful. But You've got a hospital that isn't able to mm. accommodate the thousands of people that come in every day. So it is, it is a tough decision. Do we know what the building was used for? Oh, that is a good question. Mm. I believe... Was it a home or was it part of the hospital? Oh, at it, point? it was... I believe it was a home at first. Okay. And then it has been unused for yes. many, many years. Only because Toby really doesn't, isn't able... They can't put nurses in there. They can't put doctor's offices in there, really. So, oh. All right, so we got that. So people should be looking forward to that on Wednesday, January 31st to yes, weigh in their uh, opinions. 6 p.m. in 6 Town Hall Auditorium. Okay. Everyone's welcome to come. Okay. All right, so then we move on to town election. So the selectmen, the Board of Selectmen is looking to change the date. Yes, they announced this at a Board of Selectmen meeting recently. And right now, how it works is the town has their election a few weeks before town meeting. Mm -hmm. So you are getting, this is the Board of Selectmen's argument, you're getting people, new people on boards, and then at town meeting you're voting on these issues that people have been working on, people have been thinking about for months, and you've got new people who really, they're just, they're new. They don't know, okay. they're, they're new to the, the process. Mm. So their thinking is if we hold the election after town meeting, we'll have the people who've been on those boards all those months and years mm -hmm. voting, debating, deciding the issues. Okay. So that's why they want to move the election. This wouldn't be for this election. The next election. This would be for the next uh, election, 20... 2020? Oh, no, later this year. So 2019. Sorry, 2020. 2020, yes. 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 Okay. So it seems that Peter Tatterbaum, Alan Slavin, they are they are sponsoring this, so is Derek Sullivan He's right. considering this. The, How about the people, town? What, what are people saying? Well, the process would be, for this change to happen, they would have to approve it at this coming town meeting in April. Okay. And if it's approved there, so people will get a chance to debate it at town meeting, talk about it, think about it in mm. the weeks leading up to it. And as far as uh, people talking about it, in town, it was just announced. Okay. I know most of the town officials are in favor of it. I don't know what people are on the street are saying. I haven't had a chance to get out and really take yeah. the pulse of the town on this issue yet, just yet. Okay. What do you think? Do you think it's going to be a major issues? A issue? I don't believe so. Mm. It's mostly procedural, but uh, as Alan Slavin said, the town's been doing it this way since 1977. So it is a big change for something that seems to have been working just fine for 40, 50 years now. Yeah, like why now? Why are they waking up now? Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. That's um. a good question for Peter. <laughs> <laughs> you should have him on the show sometime. Yeah, he's a character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have to wait until you're in town meeting to know people's uh, opinions uh, on this. You, they're talking about... They're doing this in order to give more time to those upcoming members, those newly elected. Mm -hmm. But really, how many newly elected people do we get each election? Uh, every, every year, there's usually one or two seats up okay. on all the boards. So I believe there's one, uh, I don't quote me, there's one yeah. or two open seats on the board uh, of select men, one yes. or two on school committee. And they do that so that you're not getting a whole new slate of people every election. You can kind of cycle in and cycle out. Okay. So then is this worth it if we're only getting one or two people? Like we have to change everything because of that one or yeah. two people. Well, I, I can see the, the selectmen's argument and a lot of towns do it the way they're proposing. So this isn't like a radical change. Okay. Many, many towns in the state have their elections after town meetings. So I think it's more a matter of just getting up to like a better practice okay. for what they feel. All right, and also people really, it's not going to affect us rather than just to know. You'll have to go cast a ballot on a sunny day in May instead of a rainy day in April. So. Oh, yes, yes, okay, I can yeah. see why, why that. Yeah. All right, so that's another thing to look forward to on um, this town meeting. Mm -hmm. So 
are we, apart from back to the homestead, apart mm. from the January 31st hearing, do you think this is going to get to the town meeting? Oh, this wouldn't go before town meeting. Okay. This is between the Historic District Commission and South Coast. Okay. And like I said, medical facilities in the state, they enjoy certain protections when it comes to wanting to expand mm. and provide more services. So it's, it's really out of the town's hands except for the Historic District Commission. Yes. And uh, Toby emergency entrance, not, not to say threatened, but when Verlife was trying to open in, mm. uh, their retail marijuana, mm -hmm. that was the big argument. Right. How was it going to affect the emergency? That's interest? an interesting thing because I thought it was going to be a lot busier than it has been. Me and I too. really haven't seen, I mean, there's people there, it's very quiet, the shuttle comes up, they get out, they walk in, mm -hmm. they leave. It's not really the, like in, in Leicester, in the central part of the state, yes. they had massive problems. Huge lines, people throwing garbage out of windows, noise, and we haven't seen any of that here in town. No, and I was looking forward to that. I mean, news-wise. You forward to that? Oh, well, news -wise, yes. then I make pr programs, yeah. you know. My name well, we, is we out there. We both covered the opening. We did. And that was an exciting day. It was, but, you know, I wanted, I'm just thinking, that if more and more people were there, uh, Main Street was blocked, and I was like, yes, this, mm -hmm. this is news. Well, very life, the shuttle will be stopping at the end of this month. Okay. So then people will have to park... I don't know. But I'm, I'm, sh I'm thinking that they're going to stop the shuttle bus because the numbers have declined, right? Oh, no. Their plan from the start was to stop the shuttle bus at the end of this month. Okay. Yeah. They've actually hired more staff because they're seeing so many people come in. Interesting. Yeah. People that I do not see really. And they're expecting even more in the summer. Okay, so but... So I, I imagine the summer is probably going to be pretty busy at that corner. By then, we probably are going to have the two more uh, marijuana stores. Two more marijuana stores. We, we were supposed to have three, a total of three, right? Oh, um, there's, there's a difference between retail okay. and there's quite a few applications for processing and manufacturing. Which ones are coming? I know Ghana Brands is going to be processing, yes. manufacturing and processing. Exactly, and that will be at the Tremont Nail property. Yes. And that's, people can't go and buy products there. Uh, yeah. That's just like a uh, light manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. People show up to work, they leave. Okay. There'll be deliveries coming in and out, but no, no tractor trailer trucks. It'll be like kind of like vans. All right. And uh, so, what about the third one? I forget the name, but that's slated for one of the industrial parks. Okay. Similar. Uh, that that would be a testing facility as well as a processing facility. So you're telling me that Wareham is only going to have our life? For the immediate future, it looks that way. I'm sure there might be other applications I'm not aware about. Mm. I haven't checked with the building department in a little while, so I don't have a good answer for you on that one. So then, back to Toby, they are trying to demolish this homestead in order to expand the emergency right. um, emergency entry, entry and also the emergency department. And you're saying that in, in the summer, real life business will pick up even more. Oh, that's a good point I didn't think about. You'll have construction. Yes. Then you'll have Vera life, And then you'll have people will have to park mm -hmm. to use fair life. Like, I don't know if that will if that will be at Bessie Park, will yes. that be on Main Street, where are people going to go? Because waterways will be open, so we cannot use waterways. Exactly. And Tremont Nail, I do not know, depending on how many people they're getting, I do not know if Tremont Nail can accommodate. Mm -hmm. Also, if Organa Brands will be there, I do not think they would actually want. I'll have to look into that and come back on the show sometime. It, I would love for you to come okay. back on the show sometime. Well, um, thank you for that. Um, we have learned a lot, and once again, come back with more facts. Great, Queen. For thank us. you so much for having me. This was a real, uh, real fun for me. Thank Appreciate you. It. So, um, that was Matt, everybody from Wareham Week to talk about the demolition of their homestead at Toby, Toby Homestead, and also we talked about a little bit about the, um, on the changing of election date for next election. So there is this little tradition that I have started here. Um, and that is, I will replay a program that I have done in the past. So today I'm going to play you an interview that took place at Wareham High School. And I went to speak to them about their cell phone policy, if it's working, if it needs to be remended. So here is the video. Take a look. They are fun and exciting. I am talking about cell phones. Now, cell phones and fast internet is a bad combination in the class. Cell phones are well embedded into our personal lives, but do they have a place in schools? 
cell phones disruptions have become quite severe, driving some schools to issue a zero cell phone policy through mandating their students to use a smartphone lock, a pouch that prevents the students from having access to their cell phones. But not every school administration views cell phones as an enemy, and certainly not at Wareham High School. Currently, the cell phone policy at Wareham High School grants the use of cell phone only during lunch break. However, the administration is exploring the possibility of increasing this privilege by having the students also have access to their cell phones between classes. Do you think that's going to present an even tougher challenge, that if you have it in a hallway, what's going to prevent a student to not bring it in the classroom and using it in the right, classroom. Right. So, you know, it's, it's all about the teachers and, and what they permit. Okay. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of promote what you permit. And, um, you know, I would expect the teachers to follow the handbook. Uh, keep in mind, all these changes would have to be approved by the school committee at the end of the year when we go to ask for our handbooks to be approved. So there's still a lot of hoops to go through uh, in this process. But, you know, the theory is, you know, if the student has to send a quick text to the parent, they would do that in the hallway versus trying to sneak onto their cell phone in the classroom. So I would hope what we would see is that there'd be less students inclined to try and use their cell phone in the classroom and more students paying attention to the instruction that's going on. Now, some teachers, you know, listening to this program, they would argue that that's not their job to enforce you know, cell phone policy in the classroom, that, you know, they should not be, um, be able to teach and also be able to monitor who's on their cell phone and who isn't, right? That just cell phones to be banned out of the classroom, period. So when the students are in the class, it's just all about learning and the teacher's there to fulfill his or her position. Right, but there's a lot of housekeeping procedures that teachers have to deal with. This is just one of them. And I think if you approach it early and set the tone early and often, what happens is the students understand the expectations. Okay, so what are you hearing from your teachers, you know, about their cell phone policy? Well, you know, they, they have a voice. Um, they are being surveyed as we speak. So I think what we're hearing is that, you know, times are changing. They're looking to make some modifications. Uh, certainly, I don't think they want them in the classroom, and I can understand there's really no need now. You know, if we weren't a one-on-one -on -one school, you know, we'd probably need the cell phones to be used for educational mm -hmm. purposes. Um, they're, looking, they're looking for um, a little bit more consistency as far as, you know, first uh, three-step process. They're looking at first step being a warning by the teacher, second step kind of being a detention, mm -hmm. third step would be a referral to administration, and then it would go up from there. Okay. So what role do you think the cell phones should play in, in the school? So from an educational standpoint, uh, you know, the opportunities are endless in regards to what it could do in the classroom. Um, you know, even in ma the math class, although it's not a scientific calculator, there's still a calculator on there. You know, just, just the, 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 what can be done in the 21st century from an educational standpoint with phones, it's, it's awesome. Cell phone usage in school is a polarizing issue. Some teachers have disclosed that they are not fond of these devices, while others feel that cell phones can be used as a positive tool. So I definitely just want them to know that it's a tool and actually you can, you can learn a lot on a cell phone besides going on apps like Snapchat. You know, there's a lot of tools and apps that are made for the classroom um, and I'd rather them learn to do that than um, just be distracted by it on their desk. So are we saying that the pros are much, way more than the cons in this particular situation, in this particular school? I think it's probably neutral. And I think it depends on who has the phone. You know, we choose to address it maybe a little differently than some schools. And how do you address it? What's the message that you, do you think it's just the majority of your students are, you know, wonderful students that they just listen to the policy and respect the policy? Or is it about the message that you deliver? What kind of message do you deliver? I think we try and bring the message early. The first two days we meet with all the students and go over some policies. We don't read all the policies to them, but they get the handbook and they get a chance to read through it and understand the policy. And um, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's about respect. 98% of the kids, they don't have an issue with the cell phones. 2% uh, we have to deal with on occasion, but really we've got other issues besides cell phones that we really have to deal with. The argument is that cell phones can also be used in case of emergencies, but is is that the student's role to play 911 responder, also being a student, or should their system be respected 
in school, that there are teachers with cell phones, that uh, there are protocols to be made. We spend a lot of time on school safety. I knock on wood. I hope we never have yeah. an issue with that. But certainly that's an area where you can say cell phones could be used in a, in a you know, in a positive way and with a negative situation. I think uh, the more information the police can get, the better, so they know how to respond in any situation. Certainly, you know, you'll be bogging down the 911 system, but there's a, the systems in place to bounce to other areas of the state to receive those calls. But I think if, God forbid, you ever have a situation, you want everyone to be your eyes and ears. You know, the, the more eyes and ears you have, I think the better. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us this morning. You are watching Good Morning Wham. You are morning show. <laughs> and now for the coffee segment, we are going to play the interview I did with the chairman of the Wham Board of Selectmen, Mr. Alan Slavin. During the interview, which was part of the official report program, uh, Mr. Slavin and I talked about the future and prospects in Wareham under marijuana. So take a look. <music> The town of Wareham closed the year 2018 with a historical landmark. On December 21st, Verlife, a medical retail marijuana company in the town, had opened its first recreational marijuana store, setting precedents for the retail marijuana business in Wareham. Also in that same year, during the fall town meeting, Wareham residents voted by 81% in favor of a zoning law by change at a 7.2 acre site on Elm Street, formerly known as the Tremont Nail Factory. The town referendum came with the incentive of a potentially $2.4 million deal that may potentially help rejuvenate the decade and a half abandoned town owned site. Now, a month into the new year, Verlife still operates their recreational retail marijuana store on Main Street, Wareham, and the town officials boast that the potentially $2.4 million deal for Wareham will soon come to fruition. So here is the question. Is the town looking for its own golden goose? And is part the answer? Joining me in the studio is the chairman of the Wareham Board of Selectmen, Mr. Alan Slavin, here to help us digest the future and the prospects of the retail marijuana business in the town of Wareham. Welcome, Alan. Pleasure to be here as always. So you're here to help us digest the retail recreational marijuana and the prospects that uh, the industry may bring to the town of Wareham. I would like us to start with Verlife. May you please remind our viewers, remind us why this town voted um, to legalize or recreational marijuana in the town of Wareham? Well, basically we had approximately 57% of the population during the ballot question vote for it. So that basically put that in place. And uh, we did go to a town meeting and uh, did a zoning for you know for the medical, and that was the first piece, which was you know, the Verilife group, and then we added, of course, the areas for retail as well as you know manufacturing for locations as well. The Verilife location, of course, was done for medical, um, and at the time that was done, there was no retail regulations in place, so a lot of people question why Verilife is where it is and how can they have retail there, you know, because of traffic, you know, parking, etc. And the simple answer is it was never planned as a retail location, really, because the rules and regulations weren't in place, because the Cannabis Control Commission hadn't dialed it in yet. Uh, none of us knew that the medical marijuana facilities were going to have first shot at retail as well, which was another thing that got changed as they went on. This whole process with the Cannabis Control Commission is just a complete ongoing thing where it's like a living entity that keeps changing. Uh, the original ballot question, just so everybody understands, was written by the industry, not by the state, not by the town, or not by individuals. So when they wrote the ballot question, it was to favor whatever they wanted to do. 
because in that ballot question it has also the idea of delivery. If you say you're here in Wareham and let's just say next door Bourne says no marijuana retail sales, the facility in Wareham can deliver to Bourne or to any other town. So that kind of makes it why if you vote no, you're still going to have marijuana in your town. And the other piece is the social clubs, which is on the question right now, which was supposed to come in in November. They've delayed the, what they're going to do until February, you know, and we don't have any regulations in place as to where social clubs can be located or not. So that's another issue that we're going to be dealing with. We get 3% taxes well, from them. We get, from Vera Life, we have two different things. You have to remember that we have two, two components. The ha medical and the, the medical. And the medical is done with a host agreement, which I think is $100,000 the first year, and I believe it goes up to either 125 or 150 over the three years. That's our host agreement there. And there's also some other considerations of funds they contribute to the town. I don't have the exact what, what they are because they're kind of negotiated, you know, to do a few things. They may give us money for a certain project or something. The other part of the business there, uh, which is part of the Pharmacana slash Verilife group, is the actual retail. The retail, the way the state has set that up, is that we get 3% of the gross sales of retail marijuana sales from the facility up to $10 million in sales. That's the cutoff of how this was written up you know, up by the state. Up to $10 million. Dollars, okay. Which means the maximum income we can get per year from a retail operation is $300,000. And we have two other retail uh, units approved for. Well, one is in the process down on Route 6 and 28. If you know where the Sears Roebuck is down there, I think it's Jordan Plaza, if I remember right, the building. And if you look at the right-hand side of that building, you can see where they're actually working on getting a retail store set up there. They have to get their approvals from the state, same as the other one. It takes a long time. And we also have the other one in the industrial park. So when those two come on board, uh, I expect the traffic issues to even subside even more because they're easier to get to. And I don't think the issues will be as much. I think the real question is, when we have three stores, will we do more business? And if we had one, the answer would be yes. Uh, but each store probably is going to do less than they can do if they're all by themselves. And they're not only opening here in Wareham. I believe up to this point, there are about eight stores that have already opened in I Massachusetts. I think it's either five or six, but there's a couple coming online this week. Okay. You know, and I think you're going to see over the next month or so, uh, the numbers increase substantially because a lot of them are slow getting the paperwork in. And again, they took the, anyone who was a medical facility and gave them priority. So with that 3% that we get from the gross sales from the recreational side of Verlife, um, how much money have we made so far? They've been open for a few weeks now. They opened on Decem in December 21st last year. Do we know? No. Can we predict how much they made? Not really because we don't, you know, we know that the maximum number of people they could handle in a day was 800. Mm -hmm. And I think they were limiting, and again, I'm just, I was away for quite a while in December, so I don't have any real details, but I think they were limiting the amount of product you buy to one ounce at the time as far as the actual marijuana. I don't know about the edibles and stuff, but the bottom line was, you know, they probably could purchase between three and four hundred dollars. So if you take, say, three hundred dollars, just as a number, which could be wrong, times eight hundred people, that's your gross per day. And you take three percent of that, assuming they hit that eight hundred. I, I think it's dropped, I think the volume as far as the number of cars, from where it started over at the uh, Water Wiz, Water Wiz to where it went to Trail and I think the cars per day is is dropped down somewhat. Okay. So I don't, I don't know. If, yeah. I see. They also had a problem. They had help come in the first week from the corporate headquarters and stuff, and those people left after a week. So the reason the hours changed wasn't because of traffic or anything else. It was because they didn't have staff to handle doing it. So they were open like 12 to 5 for retail. And I spoke to Shelley when I got back just to ask how things were going, and she has to go home to like 9 o'clock at night. Do we know when those numbers will come? Do we know when? Quarterly. Quarterly, okay. Yeah. Um, so apart from the 3% gross in sales for the recreational side, do we have any more income coming from Verlife for recreational marijuana business? Are we getting any... Are, are they renting the building from us? No, they own the building. They own the building, so we, we're not leasing the building to them, so that... Yeah, it's and the they, way. as of right now, they pay for the parking program that they have, mm -hmm. the shuttles. They pay. But they for pay for. They paid for what? Uh, Waterways. 
now they're paying for Tremont for us, Nail. Tremont Nail. So I believe. I believe. I thought I heard a, a figure of twenty five hundred dollars a month for the f for the parking facility. So now this time we're benefiting. That's coming to us. That comes we to us. Tremont. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that money for that money there would go into the Tremont Nail for any work that needs to be done at Tremont for making it better or whatever else. Oh, so that's uh, talking about Tremont Nail, and we'll dive in to Tremont Nail even more in details later on. But um, I thought every anything that is made at Tree Nail is going to go to the general fund. Not really, because some of the money that comes in, you know, like for the uh, Organa brands, there's a portion of that money will go for the redevelopment of Tree Nail and stuff, and some of it may go to the cost of the town having the facility. It's but, a set amount. Um, I don't. I think there is, but I have to go look for it. I have. I can't give you something. I'm not positive the numbers, but I think there's a percentage breakout somehow okay. on that. You know, as we go through. Now, Verlife did off did ha have their own private security there and and during opening day for that yep. first week, and also they had Wareham police. And they pay. That's detail which they pay for. Now, tell me how Verlife Recreational Marijuana Business can pay Wareham police, because recreational marijuana is a drug under federal law. So Correct, but still, the bottom line is, at the end of the day, you have to make a decision for public safety and stuff, and the they basically, have, even though they're not very happy about it, this is the, for as far as the safety for the town, this is what's required. So did we as a town break the law? No. Because the state of Massachusetts, the attorney general, accepts the marijuana business. I mean, well, the federal government could come in and arrest us all tomorrow. You know? <laughs> See, this is, this is Alan. Each time, you, you know, there's a good and bad uh, to, to your statements. I, I mean, it is. I mean, the federal government says marijuana business is illegal. They can't put money in the banks. So basically, you know, the state of Massachusetts, like every other state that's passed marijuana, is breaking the law as far as the federal government's concerned. But none of the attorney generals in any of the states are going to rule in, the, in favor of the federal government on this. They've all said, just do business as usual. Business as usual. I mean, the state of Colorado, in order to solve the money issue, has opened up their own banks. The state has to take the money and, and, and charge a fee. I have a question similar to that later on, but you are touched upon the upcoming retail marijuana stores in the future. Do we have a time frame when they'll be coming? I would say we probably, I can't really, it's hard to predict because the, the whole process is just so convoluted in how they get it done. It's what you think is going to be one week and then it's a month later. I'm going to say two to four months we should have all three stores up operating. Two to three months. Yeah, and we probably should have the manufacturing facilities um, we're still waiting, of course, for the final okay from the Attorney General for the change of that, you know, the zoning over by the Tremont Nail piece. So I would say those places should be up and running in less than six months. Okay. And also... And I'm hoping the lab that we got approved is opened up shortly as well. Um, Verlife, part of their opening day uh, plan was to help businesses on Main Street, especially restaurants on Main Street, um, to thrive or to get into that bandwagon of having new people in the town. And they wanted, they were giving out discounts so people can go to Main Street and eat and use the mm -hmm. restaurants. Do we know if no. um, businesses on Main Street were impacted in one way or another? I know businesses were not impacted because uh, John Walshek, our acting police chief, went to Leicester and also Northampton, but especially, you know, what well, people call it Leicester, but it's really not spelled that way. Uh, and spent time with the police chief there. And that's how we found the person running the parking program for, because of the mess they had. That, that town virtually came to a stop when they opened. And John did such a great job because he went and based it on saying, we might have four or 5,000 people show up the first day. And there's no way Warham could handle four or 5,000 people, period. So he, the plans he put together of course, the number was extremely lower than that. That's why everything has worked so smoothly, so there's been no impact for traffic. I don't know if there's really any, um, I, I doubt very much there was in, you know, any business increase except for maybe a Wareham resident or someone close by here that bought marijuana and got some kind of a discount coupon and used it later. Uh, because the way they work is they come in in a shuttle, they come out in a the shuttle, they're really not waiting around anywhere that they can walk down to Main Street and buy something. They're not parking on Main Street and waiting because they have to be at the parking lot. So I don't so, think that I don't think that piece worked mm, personally. Uh, they, they meant they meant well. Now it so, was a good gesture. Yes. So n 
really no impact at all, negative or positive impact on Main Street or Main Street's culture. Do you think maybe, no. did we learn something from um, the opening day, something about Main Street, how it's designed, what we can help do to improve, things that we couldn't have noted? No, because we had no, we had no impact traffic-wise okay. on Main Street because there was no traffic. There may be people coming in, you know, through Main Street down to the waterways initially, but I think a lot of the traffic would have just gone down Route 28. And I mean, there, I think there was one accident which was just somebody, you know, taking a, an illegal left-hand turn, as always, and someone banged into one of the shuttle buses, wasn't probably on their phone or something, who knows. And that was it for the total. If you think about it, two accidents, or one accident, one, one piece there is, for the time frame and everything else, is really not unusual. I hate to say that, but that road averages 150 accidents a year. Yeah. Okay, so moving to Tremont Nell, the Organa Brands, the Colorado-based man marijuana manufacturer company, um, is soon to come to Wareham. That's what I'm reading. Wareham Week, Wicked Loco, that's what they're reporting. Yeah. How soon are we talking about? Well, like I say, I'm going to say that that could be, that will be, by the time they're up and operational running, we could have that in less than six months. They're going to come in once the zoning article of the Attorney General comes back, because it takes like 90 days once the article gets sent to them. This, at, you're waiting, we are waiting to hear from the Attorney General because it's, the town voted to uh, remand the zoning bylaw. Yeah, but rezone the zoning area for that particular overlay okay. area. So, so they, we voted attorney. for that. They've got to come back and get approval, which should be shortly. And as far as I know, there's been no issue with it. And then when it comes back, then they can sign the contracts with all organic brands. They made the, they basically, uh, Ken Buckland has negotiated the program. My understanding is that Organa Brands is going to reskin the whole building at their cost. You know, talk a little bit about what they have proposed, what this company has proposed. Well, they're basically, you know, are going to lease the building. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think the numbers are already put out there. I don't have it at the top of my head right now. Let me, let's talk about numbers again. Uh, the deal could potentially worth $2.4 million a year. And that number, we arrived to that number through rent, the $184,000 a year. We are talking about the potential 300000 a year through taxes for our town. And they mentioned 100000 in donation, annual $100,000 in donations. They can, I think that's not part of the host agreement. So that $100,000 donation per year may or may not be May or may not happen. May or may not happen. So because the state may say you can't do that, not us. The state and not organic brands. The state may rule that you can't do that. Okay. So and also they talked about jobs. They said fifty jobs are above market pay. Well, they're a cash business, so they yeah. can obviously pay more than a normal business. But those jobs are not only exclusive for Wayham people, right? No. You, obviously, whatever the jobs they need, there's going to be certain skills required. I believe they have basically committed to trying to, you know, hire Wareham residents only. But I'll say this again, that technically is really not a legal binding, you know, item. It's like when we do the affordable housing projects and we say Wareham residents get first choice. When you're dealing with federal money and stuff, and which we are here though, you can't do those things. You can't say we're going to give Wareham residents priority. You talked about the that, um we could collect up to $300,000 in gross sales tax. And that, that is n not our, um, we did not put a cap on that. That's the state putting a cap on that. Cannabis Control Commission. Because that has been the major criticism regarding this deal or any retail marijuana business to come to the town. People are asking if these businesses, we voted for these businesses to come here. We voted or for, Mar for Organa Brands to come to Tremont Nell because of the revenue. So if we're going to put a cap on the revenue, why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, basically, again, the ballot question put that in place and people voted for the ballot question. If you look at, if you spend your time and go look at Colorado, Oregon, Washington, if you look at the numbers that the state and the cities and towns get, you'll find that Massachusetts, the numbers that were accepted for here, but you know, what the industry proposed were substantially lower, maybe as much as 50% less than those other states are getting. So, we, so we, as a town, we had no say whatsoever what the numbers were going to be. We just have to vote yes or no. We voted yes or no. The state imposed what the max was. 
Because this company, I mean, I, based on your research, Organa Brands is a not big for life. Right, it's a it's a global company. So yeah. when we are talking about three hundred thousand dollars a year, that's it's a nickel in a pool of hundred dollar bills. Well, isn't you it? You have a you have a business that basically in the in the industry is you know fighting you know to try and pay us as you know, or anybody as least as possible. It's it's just the way things work in this world. And unfortunately, we don't have any say as far as the percentage numbers go. We're limited to what we can do. They, their contract is a five-year re renewable contract. Yep. Uh, in that contract, w what is fixed revenue and what is negotiated? There's really no negotiated revenue in that contract. It's strictly you have a five-year lease on the property and you have five years at a max of $300,000 a year in sales for revenue income. That's what's allowed by the state to us. That's all we can do. That's the host agreement which they go through. The company said that it's going to, it's planning on processing 60 to 90 pounds of marijuana products a day. Yep. Okay. So I have sent an email to the company's communications officer yep. regarding if we should be concerned with order. Did you hear about that? No. Okay. I, I, saw, I see you laughing. But he came back to me, respectively declined to answer my questions. Oh, they're not going to answer numbers. Well, he said that their company is about to go global, so they're going to get back to me once the process is done. Should we be concerned with order? I mean, our selectman, Peter Teitelbaum, who's also um, an environmental lawyer, he is very optimistic about Organa Brands. He does not seem to be concerned with order. Should we be as confident as he? They've already, been, they've already come and talked to us about how it works and how they can take care of it, so I don't think that's an issue. Okay. I don't expect it to be an order issue, period. <laughs> because oh. th that was discussed right from the beginning as far as what are you going to do with the odor and stuff. And they basically, it's almost like when they first put the, uh, where I live on Oak Street, they put the new sewer system in there. Because there was nothing running through the system, we had a lot of odor coming back through the houses, out through the you know, bathroom vents on the roof. And we basically we were given these charcoal filters to put on there coming out, which el it, it eliminated the odor. Once the volume of uh, sewage was starting to go through the pipes, it, all disappeared. In this case here, they're going to have the same kind of filtration system where they have to vent out and that will take care of it. Now the president of Organa Brands, he had, this wonderful, he had these wonderful words to share online. He said, from the moment I set foot uh, in Wareham, we knew it was a match. The historical Tremont nail factory was a key factor in the prosperity of Wareham in the past and we look to bring that same spirit of ingenuity and know how to create a thriving business epicenter in this wonderful, he called it city, but it's a town. Um, that's, so, nice, that's nice PR. I, 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 <laughs> okay, so that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, call me cynical. However, th they are a business. It's a Why business. should they care how we feel? Why should they care about where him? They need, to, they need to express concern and they need to work with a city or town because they need a host agreement in order to function here. I mean, if they were a normal business, they could come into any city or town, meet the zoning requirements as far as what's required and open. There are certain businesses you can't locate in certain areas because of zoning. Hmm. In this case here, because this is the marijuana industry, which is new and there's resistance to it, because you gotta remember, 43% of the town did vote no at the end of the day. So 43% of the people in Wareham are not being represented by what's happening. Now, so, you know, you have a business, when you come in with a business that's going to be controversial or you're going to locate, like we have, you know, with the Dakota Partners with that 40B thing, you've got to try and work with the town and tell them whatever you're going to tell them. And, the sweet uh, words that the town would like to hear. Are you pleased with what he's saying? Are you buying into it? I ignore it personally. You ignore it. Despite the normal business expectations um, and the annual cash re tax revenue that we'll get from this partnership. What else could, does the company, will the company offer us? Technically, they really don't have to. I mean, I expect that you'll probably see some uh, nonprofit organizations go to these different uh, marijuana operations and look for contributions or grants for, but I'll, just, I'll put some stuff out there which is really, I have no knowledge one way or the other. But I expect like, like the Warham Village Association possibly to look for some money to help with some different events during the year. Uh, the Onset Bay Association does a tremendous job down in Onset. 
I would think that they would probably reach out. Uh, Turning Point, some of the nonprofits of food, uh, again, to promote the, pub, the image of the company in the town, this is what I think will happen. But this is separate from the town government. Who is going to be paying for the electricity, for water? Is that part of the rent? It's all, part, it's all triple net lease rents. It's within the rent, so they one hundred and four thousand no, additional to that, or it's included. My, in the rent? my understanding is triple net means they pay for all the expenses. They pay for us, okay. and they would pay for sewer, EDU, whatever that's going to be. And they I don't sold. know what that's going to be because you have to figure out what's going in there, and the sewer department is going to have to come up with that one. They're yes. going to have to look at it and figure out how many EDUs they're going to have to pay. So they're not going to be paying the same tax, um, the same rate for the sewer as other businesses. Well, they pay the e yeah, they pay they pay EDUs, but they may they may have to pay like ten EDUs as an example. Oh, oh yeah, because they're going to be a little bigger than. Well, it, it depends on how much water they use and what what happens with that water. Does it go into the sewer or whatever? We have a we've had a pump uh, in that in that parking lot for years, which is not really in that great a shape. So there's already been a question, who's going to pay to upgrade the pump? And my answer has been that if the pump needs upgrading because of the volume coming from Organa Brands, then Organa Brands should pay for that. If the pump is just old and worn out and normal maintenance needs to be replaced, then the, top, the sewer department has to pay for it. So, I'll, Alan, I have this question for you. I raised this question during my intro, and that is, I know that we're in this town is res very restricted when it comes to revenues, when it comes to money. We, we, are, yeah, we're, we have to make major cuts. We are looking at a new elementary school, police station would like to have a new police station. 20 new policemen. <laughs> 20 new policemen. So we could use the money. And I'm wondering if people in this town, if of town officials it, are thinking or hoping that the recreational marijuana business is going to be our golden goose. No, because it's not enough. You're looking, if, if you had everything coming in at max numbers, you know, for the year. On a to finish up that video, you can go on our YouTube channel and you can see the full video. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is Good Morning Wareham Show um, that you have just finished. That was the chairman of the Wayham Board of Selectmen, Mr. Alan Slavin, discussing about the future and the prospects of marijuana in our town. If you have missed this morning's show, do not worry. This episode will re-air to this evening at 6. Uh, with that, join, I will join you next Monday. We are going to have the um, YMCA here for our, their weekly update. Until next week, I wish you all a wonderful day with him.